Welcome to Asian Review. I'm your host, Bill Sharp. Our show today is the decline of Taiwan's Nationalist Party, the Kuomintang, the party of Chiang Kai-shek. And our guest is Mr. Michael A. Turton. His highly respected blog, The Taiwan View, is not shy to tell it like it is or to probe deeply for the facts, the real facts. So just what is the future of the Nationalist Party? Since it was catastrophically routed in both the 2014 9-1 elections, and the January 2016 presidential and legislative elections, it seems to have no platform or definite plan of revival. Welcome to Asian Review. It's good to see you, Michael. I think we lost audio. Hello? Oh, there we are. Okay, good, good, good. Hi, welcome to Asian Review. I thought we lost the audio there for a second. Um, wow. Um, is the Guomindang really going down for the count? What do you think? I mean, you're a long-time observer, astute observer of Taiwan politics. Is, is it down for the count? I think so. I think um, its power base has shrunk. Uh, it's largely popular only among older people and in mountain areas, which are very undeveloped and don't have large tax bases and have um, in populations that depend on tourism and so on. It's, uh, it has no rock star politicians. Ma was the last one who was really a brand name. We'll have some news about him later today. <laughs> well, let's, th uh, yeah, let's get right into that because there is some really, really big news about Ma ying today. Ma ying the former president of, of, ta of Taiwan, a two-term president, served eight years in that position, had several other very prominent positions in Taiwan politics, the mayor of Taipei, secretary to Chiang Kai-shek, I believe it was, and um, a minister of uh, justice. What's the news? I'll let you deliver it. Well, the big news is prosecutors announced this morning that former President Ma Ying-jeou is going to be indicted for leaking state secrets in the uh, Wang affair. You may remember that uh, Wang Jinping allegedly, uh, allegedly lobbied on behalf of PPP whip Ke uh, in a in a way that was uh, inappropriate and some might say illegal, but that uh, and Ma heard that news from SID Chief Wong and then made that news public and attacked Wong publicly. Mm, mm. The result was uh, not good for my job. <laughs> <laughs> Ma certainly tried to do in Ma, Wang Jinping, no, no doubt about it. And, and you know, it seems to me that, um, that, that you know, there's always this, this thing that, you know, the courts are in the pocket of the Guomindang, all the judges are Guomindang appointed, Guomindang dinosaurs. And they ruled against Ma. They ruled in Wang Jinping's favor, and he still pursued that. Now, I, I, and I, I know lots of people have just told him to stop, and he, he, he wanted to persist. So he, he sort of um, cooked his own goose, didn't he? Not only did he cook his own goose, he split his party and, and tanked its reputation at the polls. He even tanked the NT dollar when he attacked Wang Jinping. Uh, Wang, uh, Wang so, uh, you know, he never recovered from that. Basically, mm. and they, he did vast harm to the campaign. Well, now that he has been indicted, I suppose he won't be able to leave Taiwan. His passport will be confiscated. Uh, I have no idea. Things seem very flexible in cases involving high officials. <laughs> <laughs> and he just came back from the United States. He was on a 12-day visit to the U.S. He gave a big talk at Harvard Law School. His alma mater. Uh, a Brookings uh, Institute in Washington featured him in a special program with Richard Bush and Douglas Paul. And, um, <laughs> and now it goes back to Taiwan into the welcoming the arms of the law. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> well, it's a long process, and he uh, beat it once already. So mm. uh, I, I don't expect much. Well, but it is good that he did. Well, you know, um, I, 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 I swore to not reveal his identity, but I had an interview with a very, very prominent member of the Guomindang shortly before leaving Taiwan on December 21st. And um, we talked about the Guomindang's image, and my comment to him was, 
you guys don't seem to have a, a, a road forward. The only thing you talk about is cross-strait relations, cross-strait relations, cross-strait relations. You got to have some other policies. And, and he said, yeah, yeah, you know, we do have a terrible perception problem. A lot of people think that of us, that we, we only have a concern about cross-strait relations. And without enumerating them, he said, well, we do have other plans, but he seemed to be at a loss to explain exactly what they were. That's how the public perceived them. And once ECFA was shown to be a failure, I mean, trade has basically stagnated and gone down, and of course our, our trade surplus with China got wrecked by ECFA. And the service tax was rejected. What does the KMT have? So it's, um, their reputation as economic wizards was destroyed by the mind show administration. Mm. Uh, they don't have any young people. There's no rising young politicians. There's no place to development develop them, they came to use in deep trouble. And, and, and the, the traditional basis of their support was um, military folks, the bureaucrats, and the teachers. And it that, seems that the last election that fell apart because lots of the parts of that coalition, you know, they voted in other directions, not necessarily for the DPP, but, but not for the KMT. So that's, right. that's all crumbling. Yeah. Well, Ma had uh, done pension reform, and also he had done some reform of the bureaucracy, which was much needed, but which angered a lot of people in the bureaucracy. That, that's and, a uh, tough job for who has, who is ever in power. Yeah. That's a really tough job. And uh, a lot of the patronage networks down south and in central Taiwan had been, had felt they had been cheated by, their, cheated by the KMT, which they had supported for a long time. That's one of the reasons who this town lost in Taichung. A lot of the local factions switch sides because they feel they didn't get enough from him. So uh, this has been happening. Not only have those groups, teachers, bureaucrats, soldiers, uh, reconsidered the KMT, but also there's a lot of other, uh, they've lost their local factional support. Look at the East Coast. There's now two DPP legislators there. That's unheard of. That's unheard of, right. Yeah, and they've lost, they're losing their support in Aboriginal areas. So the, the KMT doesn't look like it has a very bright future, and I don't see much creative policy making, as you said, coming up. You know, it seems to me one strength that the KMT traditionally had was it was very good at grassroots organization. In, in, in American politics, they call that getting out the vote, right? Right, and yes. Uh, especially with aboriginals, uh, uh, aborigines. Um, do they still have that ability to muster support at grassroots level and, and with the Aborigines? Not, it's, it's been impaired over the last several elections because the, the local precinct chiefs and neighborhood chiefs are slowly, are slowly becoming DPP, whereas they were always KMT. Mm. A lot of those networks were, uh, the local factions have become less important over the last two or three election cycles. Nathan Bado has a good analysis of that on frozen garlic somewhere. Um, and the demographics are changing. Areas that have long been strongly KMT, especially the type A housing bubble, has been pushing young people out into the blue areas that were once strong KMT, but those young people are all DPP people. That's what no the Sunflower Movement's all about, right? Is young people hoping for a better future, a house, a, a, a respectable job with good pay? Well, there's that, yeah, and also they don't want China to control the Taiwan economy. And they don't want China, they don't want to be part of China. Yeah, exactly. Despite China's... So all these, all these changes are really hurting the KMT. The party is... Uh, and the, the mainlander at the top, because the, the KMT's internal vote is controlled by the old soldiers, and they identify with the mainlanders who came over in 1949, mm -hmm. and that core still controls the party. And as long as the old soldiers control the vote, then that core will continue to control party and they won't be responsive to Taiwan the way they should be. Who, who are some of those key figures in the Kuomintang, just for the benefit of our viewers, who are some of those key, key figures in the Kuomintang, the Nationalist Party, who still exercise such great control, the, the older folks, if you will, that you just the alluded to? The older generation is people like Lian Jen, who used to be the premier and then ran for president in 2004. Mm -hmm. oh, how about someone is probably uh, not so much anymore. Some of the uh, people like Hao Long Bing, the top of his son, is now running for the chairman. Mm -hmm. 
there's a lot of those people are quietly powerful, and they're all mainlanders who they either came over in '49 or are descendants of them, mm -hmm. and they want to keep the party as a as a mainlander operation, and they can't do that and be a Taiwanese party, and that contradiction is killing them. You know, it seems to me the Kuomintang has um, a, a big. Um, there's a leadership vacuum. I mean, Hong Xiuju is obviously not a very popular uh, chair. I've talked to people on the Central Committee of the Kuomintang. I, sh I've not, I shouldn't say their names, but they're very, um, how should I say, they had less than complimentary comments about her leadership, um, to, put it, to put it mildly. Uh, also, uh, they had some pretty terse comments about Ma, too, which um, it, it shocked me in some cases. Um, how long been? It is, some people say he is the favorite to become the next chair of the Kuomintang. What's your take? Well, he's leading in the polls, but uh, the, the kind of polling they're doing doesn't tell you whether who they're polling. If the old soldiers support uh, Hong Xiaozhu, she'll win. So mm -hmm. they put forward a couple of candidates to split that vote. Uh, Howe's got a good chance. He's moderate. He speaks well. But he's kind of also um, porridge. You know, he's not very exciting or interesting. And one thing about home, he's always interesting. Mm -hmm. <laughs> he says amazing things. Mm -hmm. So uh, it's going to be difficult for how to win. Because he doesn't, he, he's, he was lackluster as mayor of the country. What, what about Wu Dani? What do you, what do, what's your take on him? He, he's another candidate. Um, obviously, lots of political experience. Yes. A, within the KMT, he's uh, he's been pretty savvy, and he was one of he's a strong Ma supporter, and uh, he comes from Nanto, so his power his local power base is tiny. Um, he's Taiwanese, which for the old soldiers will be a problem, because they don't want to see another Taiwanese as head of the KMT, and uh, if whoever becomes KMT head is likely to be the 2020 presidential candidate. So uh, Udoni is is not going to be very popular. Mm. As a uh, I, I had a meeting with him once when he was Secretary General of the Guomidang. You impressed me as a pretty smart guy. Um, he is. He's, he's really savvy. And, and he's, he's, he's very political. He was also, as you know, the mayor of Kaohsiung. Um, right. And, and premier, vice president. I mean, the guy has experience. Um, yep. No one can right. take On that paper, away from he, him. Um, but he doesn't, laugh. he doesn't have that appeal. This camp has no one with island-wide appeal right now. No one. I remember talking to him. He had, he had accompanied uh, uh, Wu Song several times to the mainland. And, um, and, and you know, he, he told me that he had um, met Hu Jintao. And I said, well, you, Hu Jintao, he's living in the house that Mao lived in, right? He said, yeah. I said, well, that must be a really beautiful house. And he said, it depends on what your definition of beautiful is. So I don't think he was too impressed by it. <laughs> I, I think he was less than impressed. <laughs> um, okay, we're going to take a break here. Um, we, it's going to be about a one minute break and uh, we'll be right back. So uh, don't go away. Aloha, I'm Carl Campagna, host of Think Tech Hawaii's Movers, Shakers and Reformers. I hope you join us over the next several weeks as we take a deep dive into biofuels in Hawaii and explore the alternative fuels supply chain necessary for the local and global transition towards transportation fuel sustainability. Join us as we have good conversations with our farmers, our producers, our conversion technologies, our investors, and our legislators as we try to achieve our transportation sustainability goals. See you soon. Aloha Kako, I'm Marcia Joyner, inviting you to navigate the journey with us. We are here every Wednesday morning at 11 a.m. and we really want you to be with us where we look at the options and choices of end-of-life care. Aloha. Good afternoon, Howard Wig, Code Green, ThinkTechHawaii.com. I appear on Mondays at 3 o'clock, and my gig is energy efficiency, doing more with less. It's the most cost-effective way 
that we in Hawaii are going to achieve 100% clean energy by the year 2045. I look forward to being with you. Aloha. Welcome back to Asian Review. I'm your host, Bill Sharp. My guest today is Mr. Michael A. Turton. He's joining us uh, from Taiwan via Skype. He is the creator and editor of a really interesting blog called The View from Taiwan. And uh, a very provocative blog, extremely well written, extremely well researched. Uh, and uh, anybody who wants to know more about Taiwan should read it. Before the break, we were talking about some of the candidates um, in the upcoming uh, Nationalist Party Kuomintang um, uh, chairman race. Uh, as we went to break, we're talking about Hao Longbin and uh, Wu Dengni. Um, and I don't know, is there anything more we need to say about the candidates? It, it does seem that uh, the current chair is, is probably going into retirement. <laughs> I don't know, I wouldn't bet against her. <laughs> <laughs> she is pretty wily, isn't she? <laughs> got powerful support among the people who actually vote. Yeah. So, you know, I, I want to move on here, but uh, let me ask you this. You know, she's often advocated this peace treaty between Taiwan and the mainland. Do you have any idea what might be in a peace treaty that she conceived? Well, obviously, it would be that China, that Taiwan is part of China, okay. which would make it unacceptable to the public. So, no other conditions need, even need to be discussed. It Stop buying be. arms from the United States. Yeah, you know, all that stuff. She's talked about yeah. this before. It's yeah. old. It goes back to, you know, James Song in the year 2000. So. Mm. Mm -hmm. 2000. I, you know, um, the Kuomintang, uh, not only does it lack leadership, not only does it lack a uh, platform, uh, not only is it uh, it's its popularity limited to the older folks who, you know, uh, came with Chiang Kai-shek in 1949 or, or their offsprings. But it's divided from within, isn't it? I mean, there's the, the local faction, there's the Ma faction, there's the Lin Zhan faction, and these guys don't always get along so well. And of course, there's the light blue and the dark blue. I, I mean, you know, they always say, traditionally, they say, oh, the DPP is so divided, and it, it does have its divisions. But it seems these days, the Kuomintang is more divided than the DPP. Uh, what's your take on that? Well, I think it's, uh, it's always been pretty divided. People complain about DPP factionalism, but the KMT has spun off two political parties already. Three, really, if you want to count the MKT as a party. Mm -hmm. the, PV, the PFP and the new party, right? Right. The, the KMT's problem is that it's not only a political party, it's also uh, the, the church of this mainlander identity, right? So, and these two are often in conflict because... Uh, what was that expression, the church of the mainland identity? Was that, was that that's it? That's how I think of it, yeah. It, that's, it's, that's, it's, can it's we quote you on that? that I, or do, or uh, do you have that copyrighted? <laughs> I wish. <laughs> 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 it's, okay, it's that's weird. a really that's a very colorful expression. I really like that. <laughs> yeah, that's why Hong is so popular among the old. She's like the she's like a pope who says, "Let's roll back Vatican II." You know, everyone's going to wear hair shirts, and we're going to be saying the rosary twenty hours a day. That's where she is, and the old guys really like that. You know, Ma, um, I, 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 one of my concerns about Ma Ying Chou's presidency was that. I think that during the time he was in office, the military really lost a lost a lot. He was not a very pro-military person. The military I began to see morale problems in the military. The upshoot of espionage cases, high-level Taiwan officers being recruited by mainland intelligence agencies. Um, he, he he really. You know, he didn't really do much for the military. One thing I personally respect about Tsai Ing-wen is I think she is trying to build up the morale of the military, build up the image of the military. Um, Ma certainly, in my estimate, hurt it quite a bit. Um, well, um, and of course, his ECFA was not popular in the long term. wasn't all that. It was popular with some people, but one of the reasons that that, that, that the Kuomintang fell out of favor. So, um, 
talk to us about factionalism, because you've written some blogs, a really, really good explanation of how factionalism works in Taiwan at the very local level. Wow. Uh, I, I know that's a big question to throw on you on a show that's limited by time, but give us some hint, give us some well, feel, some the, direction. The KMT has maintained its hold over Taiwan by basically sending money, construction money, down to the local factions, which will then dole it out to their people, right? Mm -hmm. uh, as long as the KMT has its, has its hands on the, leverage of, on the levers of power, it can keep sending that money down. Again. So what we have here is the same thing they have in Japan, basically construction industrial state, where there's no part of the island that can't use even more concrete than it has now. So <laughs> the result of that has been you know, the plundering of our rivers, the destruction of our mountains, and public debts. All of the counties are in debt. That's another way that the KMT keeps hold of the factions, because the counties don't have the kind of money they need unless the central government sends it down, and it won't send it down unless the county factions cooperate. It's a very good system. The deal that the factions made with them, they would never create cross-regional or national alliances that could challenge the KMT. Mm. That's why. So it kept the factions happy by feeding them money and power. And in return, it prevented them from uh, being a rival. You know, that, that, that's an important point that um, some of our um, listeners might not quite understand unless they follow Taiwan closely, is the money is generally, for the most part, controlled at the level of the central government. And Taiwan's highly centralized. And so mayors and magistrates, they have to sort of go beg for money from the, from the central legislature, from the, from the national right. legislature. They um, have some money from like uh, land, uh, land taxes, and from uh -huh. selling off like mining rights and rivers and things like that. Mm -hmm. So whenever they run out of money, they do that. Right. And it's interesting that you say that most of the, uh, if I understood you correctly, um, that most of the counties and the cities are in debt. Is that correct? Yeah, it's debt is widespread at the local level, yeah. And it's debt to the central government. And it's not only money that they've been allocated tax monies that the central government has redistributed to them, but they also borrowed money from the central government. Is, is, that, is that, do I have That's that right? That's right. Okay. For example, if a pensioner leaves Taipei and retires to Pingdong, mm -hmm. the money in that pension, I think half of it comes from the treasury and the other half from the local government. So the local government has to get that money from somewhere, and it gets it from the treasury. Mm -hmm. so, so yeah, that's how the system runs. Mm. So if you want to be a highly successful magistrate uh, in Taiwan or mayor, you have to really know how to sing the tune to the legislature. Alternatively, you have to be the head of a municipality, which is why so many cities have upgraded to municipalities in the last decade, right? Mm. Taichung, Taoyuan, Tainan, because then they get a bigger chunk of the local budget. Let me see if I can remember. 57% goes to then goes to the counties and 43% to the to the cities. Wow! So if you're one of the cities, you get a huge chunk. That's incredible. And that gets the biggest. Well, the, the, the clock is beating on here, so uh, let's talk about uh, identity, uh, because I know that that's something you're really interested in, and that there's this obviously growing sense of Taiwanese identity, something that China doesn't seem to understand, or at least it understands, but it doesn't want to admit that it understands. Right. And, and it still wants to maintain that the, those are our brethren in Taiwan. We all want to be one big happy family, return to the embrace of the motherland and when i go I, I was invited to xiamen university taiwan research institute during my fellowship in taiwan and i i uh, was asked to address some graduate students master's degree level students and i just told them my view of taiwan i um i don't know if they appreciated it <laughs> but i said you know people in taiwan um they're not exactly um on pins and needles about uh, um, joining the mainland, uh, uniting with the mainland, not a reuniting, uniting. <laughs> and um, they found that very exactly. hard to believe this. That, and I remember this one student, she says, but we're all descendants of the yellow emperor. And I said, well, I'm not sure how far that's going to fly with younger <laughs> people in Taiwan. It's really, uh, it's, it's almost irrelevant uh, that they have some, whatever you want to call it, ethnic, biological, whatever. The, the key thing is the historical experience of the Taiwanese is different. It's different from Chinese. 
and uh, it's a settler state. Actually, it's a lot like the United States. And so the people there have a different experience. They've been under colonialism while also being colonialists. And um, in recent years, what's actually happened is the Taiwan identity was always there. People always thought of themselves as Taiwanese, but uh, they, that was suppressed. The community suppressed it. And then in the 90s, you saw a massive coming out. Mm -hmm. People's identities suddenly shifted, according to polls. Mm -hmm. Wow, everyone suddenly shifted in the space of like six years. But of course, people don't lose their social identities in half a decade. What they did was start telling the truth to themselves and to others who they were. And uh, now, that's the older generation. That generation's Taiwanese identity was strongly anti kmt In fact, the whole generation of activists who are over 15, 16, uh, really hate the KMT. But the young people today who have a Taiwan identity just see the KMT as more irrelevant to what to their needs and, uh, and, and linked to China. And they don't hate it as much as the older generation. They're way more focused on democracy, which is an important part of their identity. Mm -hmm. uh, and they're the first generation in Taiwan history to undergo two important things. One is to grow up in a democracy. 90 and seconds. And the other okay. is to grow up in a period of stagnating economy. That actually hasn't happened yet. We're, so we're, we're, I just was told we're down to 90 seconds. Um, oh. which, the time really flies by here. So in that time we have left here, which is probably about 70 seconds now, let me pump in this question, which is something I probably should have asked before. Taiwan, more recently, has become known as a, a country with um, a two-party system. Yeah. Are, is it going to remain that way? Or are we going to have one and a half party system? No, it's going to be two party because the legislature is a is a first past the post. This majority takes the seat, so there's no room for uh, small parties. Eventually, they'll have to look through it. So, so I, I think we'll always have a two party system. So who are the two parties going to be? It's going to be the DPP. Well, if you if you ask me in the long term, what will happen is the KMT will slowly fade, and the DPP will split into a a right wing economic and a left wing economic wing. Okay, okay. good. Well, I'm sorry to have to stop there, but you know, the devilish clock has <laughs> turned too fast on us again, and I really want to thank you for joining us. It was really great, a great discussion, and I uh, hope to see you in Taiwan real soon. <laughs>